Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Zach Horseman. I'm a master student at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. I'm also employed by Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. And this talk is uh, specifically on my master's thesis, uh, examining temperatures effects on gastric evacuation rates of fly catfish and also the absorption efficiencies and how temperature is influencing that. And so we know that fish are truly products of the environment in which they live. Due to these dynamic nature uh, of the environments, fish have evolved to be uh, incredibly plastic. And so uh, abiotic factors are known to influence the physiology as well as the behavior of these individuals, uh, which in turn influences uh, things such as growth. And so this is important to management and therefore important for us to understand and look at. And so uh, Brody uh, in 1945 suggested that there are three successive steps important to fish growth. And these included food intake, digestion, and absorption. And later Pandian uh, suggested that environmental and endogenous factors were actually influencing these three uh, successive steps, which influenced the efficiency of conversion of the food energy into fish growth. And so temperature is actually considered to be the abiotic master factor. And field, field studies have long recognized this and uh, done studies examining seasonal differences in diet consumption or diet preferences, uh, consumption rates, and abundances of both prey and uh, predator. And so Jensen examined this through a, a three year period of temperature cyclic cycle over that time uh, on an individual uh, salmon's growth rate. And he found that at these higher temperatures, uh, the growth rate would actually increase as opposed to the lower temperatures where uh, uh, growth would actually decrease. And so we're actually seeing uh, growth, somat somatic growth occurring here, um, which in turn uh, switches over to reproductive growth and ultimately the survival. So temperature is playing a big factor. And so to better understand these communities, we have to look at the individuals within the communities. And so Cook suggested uh, that there were four, uh, four um, fundamental processes important to fish survival that could be measured in a laboratory setting. And these included food consumption, growth, respiration, and waste. We know that food consumption uh, is hard to estimate in the wild, uh, just looking at field, field population or field studies. And so therefore we have to actually look at gastric evacuation rates uh, found within a laboratory setting. And so we also know that these are um, species specific and also life stage specific. Uh, and so um, we chose to look at the flathead catfish and we know this is an understudied species within a laboratory setting. Uh, they're just incredibly difficult to rear in a lab, they're expensive. Um, and so not much has been looked at as far as this. Uh, and then we know that they're apex predator within both native and non-native populations that they exist. And so it's a popular game fish uh, for many anglers as well. And so my specific objective of this uh, project was to look at temperatures influence on the evac evacuation rates of juvenile flathead catfish, as well as look at temperatures effects on the absorption efficiencies of these juvenile flathead catfish. And so we examined previous literature and found that Brett et al. Uh, 2008 actually suggested that consumption of flathead catfish uh, was rare below 15 degrees Celsius. He also suggested that 19 degrees Celsius consumption uh, was greater than at, at these warmer temperatures above 19 uh, as compared to the lower temperatures of below 19 degrees Celsius. And so we chose three temperatures uh, based on these previous studies as well as some uh, temperatures we'd normally see uh, while out in the field sampling. And so this is just a temperature graph of the Missouri River and um, kind of lines up with what we might expect while we're out there. So we chose temperatures of 17, 22, and 25 degrees Celsius to examine. Uh, we predicted that warmer water temperatures would result in a faster evacuation rate uh, and also quicker emptying times. And so like Alex said, we, we set up this lab and we set these predetermined temperatures uh, within the lab for each system, so 17, 22, and 25. And uh, went out and collected 210 flathead catfish from the Missouri River through boat-mounted electrofishing. We were selecting for size, range, size ranges from 175 millimeters up to 400 millimeters, and we were actively selecting for juvenile uh, flathead catfish. Um, and then we went ahead and actually distributed these throughout our lab randomly uh, within these three systems. We allowed the fish to acclimate for a three week period within the lab, and then we fed them 2% of their body weight per day, maintaining that, that body weight uh, through time. And so then we had, we conducted water quality and water changes routinely. Um, and then the, the, the temperature within the system did not actually vary by more than plus or minus one degree Celsius. And there's a 12 hour light, 12 hour dark photo period uh, in the laboratory. And so tank D was actually intentionally left open uh, 
And so this, this helped us be able to uh, keep water quality the same through our system uh, once we switched over to our experimental aquaria. Uh, and so each of our tanks was set up in the same manner, with an oxygen line coming in from the ceiling and the standpipes maintaining water around half full. And so we had shade cloth over each of our rearing systems. Uh, this, this was over the rearing systems as well as the uh, experimental tanks. And so this prevented stress from lighting and also from our daily uh, work conducted within the laboratory. And then we actually, this is tank D of each system. We had, we had two experimental aquaria set up in each, in each tank and they were wrapped in shade cloth to prevent the interaction of uh, the flathead catfish that we were actually experimenting on. And then we had two cameras set above each of the tanks so that we didn't actually have to look in there either. Uh, we, we could look on a, a computer monitor to see what was going on. And so we randomly selected individuals from our rearing tanks and placed them into these experimental aquaria. Uh, we starved them for a, a period of 48 hours just to ensure that their uh, alimentary canal was clear of any food. Um, and then we actually fed them a single ration of a goldfish of known wet weight. Uh, these fish were given three days to consume their meal. Uh, upon, after three days of not eating, uh, these fish were pulled from the, the experimental tank and actually placed back into the rearing tanks in a manner that we wouldn't actually um, test them again. And same with the goldfish. And we gave them three days to eat because uh, in literature it's, it's been seen that after a period of five days, uh, it could start influencing the actual gastric evacuation rates of, of species. So, um, and then if the fish did consume the meal, we actually went ahead and actually set a dissection time. And so we chose nine different dissection times of two, four, six, eight, 12, 16, 24, 36, and 48 hours, we went ahead and uh, dissected the uh, entire alimentary canal from the esophagus all the way to the anus, and then we separated it where uh, the stomach emptied into the intestines, and we squeezed out the contents uh, from both the stomach and the intestines and got the wet weights of that content. And so we know that predator size and prey size are both gonna be influential on gas evacuation rates, so this is just showing uh, my three treatments on the bottom here, uh, 17, 22, and 25, and then the, the wet weights of the individuals for both the flyhead catfish and the, the goldfish. And we found that there wasn't actually uh, any difference uh, between our treatments as far as these weights. And so the mean predator weight was actually 255 grams, and then the mean prey weight was at around three grams. And so looking at consumption, uh, we have temperature once again on the, the x-axis, and then the proportion of, the, proportion of consumption occurring on the y-axis. So uh, looking at 17 degrees Celsius, roughly 40% of our fish actually consume that meal uh, at that treatment. Uh, 22, roughly 60% of those fish. And then at 25 degrees Celsius, we had roughly 80% eat. And so we found differences between uh, 17 and 25 and 22 and 25 as far as their consumption that was occurring. But we did not see a difference between 17 and 22, uh, which could uh, goes kind of against what Brett et al. was suggesting. Um, with seeing that these rates were different at a temperature of 19 degrees Celsius. So uh, moving on to gastric evacuation rates, we found that temperature was once again playing a significant role uh, throughout the uh, gastric evacuation rates of these fish. Um, we have digestion time on the x-axis, so time zero would be that of consumption, and then we have the proportion of the meal remaining in the, in the fish, uh, fish stomach on the y-axis. So this is the meal of the fish or the, the proportion is the amount of weight in wet weight in the stomach divided by the initial weight that we fed to that fish. So uh, each of these points is actually uh, one dissection point for every individual. And then we found that 17 degrees Celsius was significantly different than 25 degrees Celsius fish. And we did not see differences between 22 and 17 or 22 and 25. So looking at a digestion time of 10 hours, we can, we can examine this and we see that roughly 25% of the meal is actually remaining uh, within a 25 degree Celsius fish as opposed to uh, roughly 60% of the meal remaining uh, at that 10 hour mark for a 17 degree Celsius fish. And so it looks at it another way. Uh, physiologists will often come up with a gastric emptying time and there is some variation within this to capture uh, an empty stomach. And so we set ours to 10% of the meal remaining and we found that 25 degrees Celsius fish would actually pass their meal within 14 and a half hours, as opposed to the 17 degrees Celsius fish, which would pass their meal in about 19 and a half hours. So roughly a five hour difference is occurring here. And because we were able to sample both the stomach and the intestines, uh, we went ahead and 
uh, examined passage through the, the actual intestines of the fish. And so we found that temperature was not significantly influencing um, the passage during this time. Uh, we see the increase over time of, as the meal passes into the intestines and then a gradual decrease uh, in this graph here. So. so this is just showing a visual graphic of uh, what's occurring within or the passage of a, a meal through a 25 degrees Celsius water fish. Uh, we see uh, the, the early on the fish's stomach is distent, or there's distension occurring. Um, the, the arrows are actually indicating where the majority of the fish or the meal is and then about where it is uh, throughout the alimentary canal as far as spread out. We see early on this, uh, the meal is actually passing quickly into the intestines, uh, suggesting that digestion is occurring in layers, um, which will be important for uh, the absorption portion of this talk. And then um, it took about until 16 hours, you see an empty stomach. And we actually, for 25 degrees Celsius fish, you can see at the end, there is no meal remaining. However, at the cooler water fish, we actually did see uh, quite a bit of uh, meal content remaining in the intestines still. And so the second part of my project was to actually look at temperatures effect on absorption efficiencies. And so we predicted that these warmer water temperatures would actually result in a quicker absorption. And it's important to define digestion and absorption here. And so our definition of digestion is just the physical breakdown of ingested material. This is occurring throughout the entire alimentary canal and it's a measure of mass uh, through that time or through that period. And so uh, absorption, on the other hand, is just the nutrient uptake. Uh, it's occurring in the cell walls and it's primarily occurring in the intestines. Uh, it's a measure of energy flow. It's a result of digestion. However, it's important to note that not all this digested material will actually uh, be absorbed by the fish. And so for, for our project, we, we took the stomach and the intestine samples that we gathered from the gastric evacuation rate uh, uh, chapter. And we went ahead and dried them in a drying oven for 72 hours. We homogenized the sample into a powder, and then we actually compressed them in for uh, preparation for bomb cal calorimetry, um, and we actually got the kilocalories remaining within those samples. And so uh, the bomb calorimeter is actually just a measure of gross energy, so this is not, um, not incorporating energy losses due to feces, due to urine, or uh, heat production, which is considered net energy, so that's just important to keep in mind here. Um, looking at our uh, or trying to predict the initial kilocalories going into the fish, we had to use a subsample of 28 goldfish. We converted their wet weights to dry weights um, through this linear regression here, and then we actually used that sample to relate back to our uh, the known wet weights of the fish fed the goldfish fed to our flat, flatheads and uh, predicted their dry weights. We then took 12 of those individuals and uh, calculated an average kilocalories remaining or kilocalories per gram dry weight and applied that uh, as well to uh, predict how many kilocalories we were actually feeding to our flathead catfish. So once again, we have digestion time on the x-axis here um, and then the proportion of kilocalories absorbed now. Uh, so this is for both the stomach and the intestines because it was hard to differentiate uh, that digestion that was occurring through time, uh, kind of piecemeal that apart was difficult. So we just went ahead and combined it all. Um, and we were looking at the potential absorption uh, through time. And so we found that temperature was not significantly impacting uh, our treatments here. We didn't see a difference between our treatments uh, as far as the gross absorption that was occurring. And so in conclusion, we didn't really have a clear uh, picture of what was going on with the temperature as far as uh, the effects on absorption. Uh, it, well, we didn't see any a clear advantage, I guess, uh, for a warmer water fish or a cooler water fish. Uh, we saw that at warmer temperatures, meals were passing quicker. Uh, consumption was increasing, and we, we thought that there was an increase in metabolic demand, uh, which was spurring on these consumption, uh, the increase in consumption. And so ultimately, uh, we believe that because the fish was consuming more, it was able to keep up with its meta metabolic demand, and therefore is likely probably contributing to growth of those individuals. Um, and so it's important for managers to consider uh, these, these differences when uh, taking uh, uh, field samples and just comparing gastric evacuation rates, understanding that temperature uh, is influencing uh, both variation in consumption and the growth of the individuals. So, um, the future direction of our project is to hopefully uh, examine more net energy. So examine energy losses due to respiration, energy loss due to waste, and kind of come up with a more, uh, I guess, direct estimate of food consumption. And so we'd also like to look at 
uh, multiple multiple feeding events, which is more indicative of wild caught fish, not just a single ration. Uh, look at actual food sources uh, that are native to this species, um, and also look at the energy net energy that's uh, available in those species as well. And then, so additionally, just look at some additional temperatures um, along with additional dissection times uh, to see how that might change. And so with that, I'd just like to thank my advisors, uh, Dr. Paletto, Dr. Pegg, and Dr. Hamill, along with my lab mates, uh, for all their help. And I can take some questions. Uh, Did you sample whenever you had your fish in the lab and you were analyzing whether or not there was corn growth weight the or did you take wild fish to do a comparison to anything? We did not actually look into differences between growth. So for growth, we did not actually look at differences, I guess, between the growth of our, or our fish that we brought in the lab or wild caught fish, but that's interesting. So we had a, a sample of 13 tagged fish. Um, that we could actually track growth within the lab, like Alex was saying, um, but we just didn't see, I guess, the, the relative weights were staying pretty consistent through time, but it would be interesting to look at wild population, I guess, back and see what's going on there. So. That's it. Thank you.